Hey guys, welcome to Real Watches, Real People, and Real Stories, lucky number seven. I'm happy to say lucky number seven, not just because the luck seven is a lucky number, depending on where you are traditionally anyway, but because this show keeps on going, and the reason this show keeps on going is because you guys keep sending in your videos. One of my favorite shows to do after Q and A's is because this gives me real interaction with you guys, my viewers. Uh, again, I get to talk to a camera all day long, so, Q and A's are great. I love all the questions you guys submit, but this video is one step closer for me, more or less being face to face with you guys. Some of you guys do show your face, some don't. Whatever you choose is absolutely fine. But thank you for these submissions and keep on sending them to ian at luxurybazaar.com and we'll continue this going. Speaking of thank you, I wanted to thank you all you guys. I received a lot of Christmas cards from you guys wishing me a happy holidays. And I wanted to tell you guys, as much as I would love to grab all of them and show them off and say thank you to each and every one of you individually, you guys know who you are. So thank you for that. And you guys also keep sending me stuff. And from time to time, I do sort of a little bit of a mail time because this is real people real watches, real stories, I felt it was fitting to show you something that I received from one of my viewers by the name of Kip. And Kip writes, Roman, thank you for taking the time to do your watch videos on YouTube. I really enjoy the content and your honesty and I look forward to each new video. The letter is a follow-up to our LinkedIn conversation on November 19th. I'm not sure if you remember, but I contacted you about my watch artwork. As a fellow watch enthusiast, I hope you enjoy some of my artwork. I've been drawing for most of my life, but have not sold or given anything to anyone other than a couple of family members and friends. As my love for watches has grown this year, I decided to do a lot of horological art. As you receive these, I will have just finished up a Lang & Son. I drew all of them on an 18 by 24 paper using graphite pencils and Prisma color colored pencils. I actually know what those are because my son actually loves to draw. He's been drawing since the day he could hold a pencil. I have some pictures in my phone. I'll have Ian pop them up on the screen. These couple of pictures he drew when he was just six years old. But I'm very familiar with graphite pencils and Prisma color pencils and all those things because I've bought those things over the years for him and now my daughters. I had a company scan the originals and print them on canvas so you not only have the first watches I have done, but also my first art transfer to canvas. Please enjoy them and Merry Christmas. Kip, I want to thank you very much first and foremost. And I'm going to show these things to you guys because these things are unbelievable. The Royal Oak, obviously I had to go with AP first because that's definitely my favorite. The PC Need Grand Chime that was sold at auction only watch, right? Of course, had to have Rolex in there. We have the Rolex Ceramic Daytona and I hope the light doesn't shine too bad off of this. But if you guys could see the details in these, it's absolutely amazing. It's like these things are alive. Gotta have the classic sub. And again, hopefully the camera can pick up the details in these drawings. And again, these are drawings that were transferred onto the canvas. It's just absolutely amazing the amount of detail that went into these. All signed number one out of 25. Kip, thank you very, very much. They will be hung. Although, Adrian's already been in my office and saw these. My sales manager, Anna, and they're kind of hinting, hey, can I have one or two? So I might give one or two to, for them to hang in their office and the rest I will hang in mine. Thank you very much for that and Merry Christmas. That certainly fits the theme. Now note, Kip didn't ask me for any shout outs, nor did he give a website or an Instagram account. Kip, if this is something you will potentially sell, send me an email, let me know what that information is and I'll put it up somewhere so that people can perhaps reach out to you and buy these things if this is what you want to do because they're certainly unbelievable and I can certainly see somebody wanting to buy those things. Whether you keep the money or give the money to charity, because if you're not looking to make money off of this, probably be a great idea. So again, shoot me an email. I'll be more than happy to share that information as well. Let's move on to some stories. And the first one comes from Chad. Hey Roman, my name's Chad. Been enjoying your channel here for I think a couple of months. I've just recently gotten to watches. Uh, this is my, uh, uh, I guess my first real watch, Omega Seamaster. Started off with a with a Steinhardt and got a Tissot. But this isn't what the video is about. This is what the video is about. Uh, this watch I inherited. It's been passed down. Uh, it was originally belonged to my great great grandfather Anton Usnik. He uh, was born in Slovenia in 1874, uh, immigrated to the United States. Was able to do a little bit of research uh, to find out about him just on Googling. Found out in 1940, he was living in Nevada, uh, working for the, uh, uh, it's, it's right there, the KCC, uh, Kennecott or something, Copper Corporation. Uh, it's Kennecott Copper Corporation. Uh, he was 65 at that time. His wife uh, was an immigrant from Ireland and uh, they lived, uh, worked there. He uh, retired after working there 30 years, and this is his retirement watch. 
So after he passed, I believe it was passed down to my grandfather and then moved over to uh, one of uh, I think my uncles and my cousin who now li who lives in Nevada uh, sent it to me. Now when I got it, uh, the crystal was cracked. Um, so I took it to a local uh, watch uh, maker, jeweler guy. And uh, about 250 bucks, got it working again, replaced the crystal. I uh, didn't want to uh, replace the, the face, of course, because it has that nice patina. But it's uh, probably one of the only heirlooms that we have um, from our family that, that came over so many moons ago. But, you know, nothing real expensive, expensive, nothing too fancy, but it is a great piece of history, and I've uh, been able to uh, get it restored. And I can wind it here. So, still works. So, so something I'm, we're going to be able to pass down, uh, one of the few things. There's only a few other things left of him. He actually died at 99 and a half years of age. I think he had a glass of whiskey every day of his life, uh, probably what kept him going. There's some uh, copper paperweight and some kind of, kind of copper smelting, but that, this, that's only, this is the only tangible thing left behind. So it's one of the reasons that I was willing to put the kind of money on this thing is I hope that uh, that's passed down to one of my children uh, one day, but this will definitely stay in the family. We never know what's, if this is going to come or go, but one of the things that has drawn me to watches is that you know one, two, three, four generations later, and we're still holding on to something tangible. So anyway, appreciate your channel. Take care. Well, you know, you guys know these are my favorite kind of stories, right? Fourth generation, a guy that lived to be 99 and a half years old with a glass of whiskey every day. But I love whiskey myself, and I don't know, I don't necessarily have a glass every day, but maybe I should start. Uh, I, I can't make out what the watch is. You never mentioned it in your video. Uh, and because of the video, I can't make out the name on the dial. I, you may have said that they may say the company name on the dial. I can't tell you what the watch is. If you send me some close-up, I certainly could do my, my research. Uh, the old school springy bracelet is awesome, and it seems to be that something special was done with this clasp. There's some sort of a crest on that clasp. Again, somewhat hard to make out. But certainly, if you send me some close-ups, I can certainly do some digging on that. And you can do some digging on your own. Uh, Slovakia. You mentioned he was born in Slovakia. I was in Slovakia, uh, not this last summer, obviously due to COVID, but the summer before I was in Bratislava. Uh, amazing town, amazing vibe, amazing people, uh, a lot of history in that town, and pretty amazing food as well. I love what you're doing here. You're holding on to the old, but yet you're starting your own trend by purchasing that particular Omega to then pass on to your children. My wish to you is for that Omega to stay in the family for four generations alongside with your great grandfather's watch, which then by that time it would be its eighth generation. And a lot of you guys have heirlooms such as these stuck away in a drawer somewhere, broken, uh, maybe with broken crystals, maybe with ripped bracelets or straps and things of that nature. And oftentimes these heirlooms, money-wise, are not worth anything. They're priceless for what they are, but they're really not worth anything. And I see a lot of guys saying, oh, well, it's gonna cost me 500 bucks to fix this thing. It's probably not gonna be worth 100 bucks. It is, because at the end of the day, the stories that watch could tell. And once it gets passed on from generation to generation, guess what, the story gets passed along with it and the memory stays alive. This is how people stay alive once they go up and see the big guy is through the memories of the living, right, as they say. But uh, Chad, thank you so much for your submission. Send me some close-ups of that. I would love to get some more extra research done on that watch. Next one is Daniel from London. Hi, Roman. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to show off my collection to you uh, on your channel. I'm fairly new to your channel, but I'm really enjoying the content you're putting out there, so thanks for that. Right. Here is my relatively modest collection. There's three pieces I want to talk to you about specifically today. So let's start from the beginning. This is my Tudor Black Bay 58. Uh, now I know there's been a, a lot of hype around this watch. I bought this watch just before I got married as a wedding present to myself and also to wear on my wedding day. Um, I was lucky enough to pick this watch up in stock in an AD. Uh, I know there's stories of a lot of people um, sitting on waiting lists for months to pick this watch up, so I was very, very grateful that I managed to get that without too much of a wait. The next one I want to talk to you about is my Hamilton Intramatic Chronograph, which is this one here. 
I'm sure you're familiar with Hamilton Brands. It's an American brand that then went over to Switzerland to make watches. Um, not a particularly popular brand, but I just fell in love with the design of this watch. Obviously the Panda dial, quite vintage feel to it. Uh, I think it's a remake of another Hamilton watch, although I can't at the moment remember what that watch was called. I think it was called the Chronomatic. Um, I bought that one when I finished my bachelor's degree. Uh, and then the last watch I wanted to speak to you about is my newest watch, which is this one here. Now this is the Tudor Royal 41 millimeter day date. Now this watch um, is fairly new to the market. I had to go to the Tudor Boutique in London to pick this up. Uh, at the time of filming, no authorised dealers were allowed to carry this watch. It was, it was only through the Tudor Boutique. Now, originally it was made for the Asian market, I believe. It's a beautiful watch. It's probably my favourite watch of the collection at the moment. I love the two-tone. Uh, I love the 80s feel to it. I know some people don't like it, but for me personally, I, I think it... It looks brilliant. I suppose it's sort of reminiscent of some other models. Rolex Oyster Quartz maybe comes to mind with the integrated bracelet. But uh, just a beautiful watch. Very comfortable to wear. Lovely strap. And obviously the day date on the dial, which is which is a nice touch. Um, so that's my collection. Thanks again for letting me discuss that with you. Uh, and I look forward to hearing any of your thoughts on these pieces. Cheers. Bye. Okay. Uh, so let's start with the Black Bay 58, a very, probably the most coveted Tudor out there, right? Uh, I would have to say, but more importantly, it's a watch that you bought and wore on your wedding day. And again, I don't know what your family situation is in terms of kids, but let's say, assuming you one day will have a son, already have a son, certainly a cool watch to pass to him to wear on his wedding day. It certainly holds a place in your heart that's, I mean, alongside with having children born, uh, alongside with having something passed on to your father or by your father or grandfather, I think your wedding day is a very important event to commemorate within the hobby that you obviously love, which is watches. Moving on to your Hamilton. Yes, this is a rework of a 1968 timepiece that they made. Uh, and the whole thing about that particular Hamilton is it gives you a classy yet sporty look. And that's the whole gimmick of it. Obviously, the Panda doll is the biggest seller in the United States. I think this watch retails for around $2,200 or $2,300. I'm not sure. Probably in the UK, it's probably a bit more. Do your pesky little VAT thing that you have going on. What I most love you said about that particular watch is that you bought this watch because you like it. And this is what I keep telling everybody else out there. It doesn't matter how much your watch costs. It doesn't matter what the resale value may be. You buy what you like, and obviously you like that. And that continues on to the Tudor that you showed. Now, I have never seen that particular variation of the Tudor they did, or they call it the Glamour Date, because they don't want to use the terminology of they did because that belongs to Rolex, so they use Glamour Date. You did mention that this may have been done for the Asian market, and oddly enough, you started comparing to other watches. It reminds you of the old Oyster Quartz due to the bracelet, I agree there. If you look at the bezel of that watch, it kind of reminds me of a turnograph a little bit, right? Because of how extra fluted that particular bezel is. What's most interesting about that watch is how flat the dial is. If, Ian, if you can go back and just zoom in on that picture, that dial is very, very flat. It seems like it's almost unfinished, right? Because you would expect some kind of a circular design there, and that makes it fairly different from some of the other glamour dates that Tudor makes. Well, first of all, I want to tell you that you still have a spot open in that box, so keep on collecting. Although I'm assuming you had a watch on your wrist as well, so maybe that's what goes into that last slot in that box. In that case, time to buy another box. Uh, I love the fact that all of this stuff sinks everything that I've always been talking about, and that is buying what you like first and foremost. That is having watches have a meaning behind them, i.e. your wedding date, uh, your college graduation date, and things of that nature, because at the end of the day, these things will tell a story, and that's what this show is about, right? Real people, real watches, and real stories. Daniel, thank you very much, and let's, let's go to the next submission. Hey, Roman, this is Adam, and here is the crazy story of my first watch that I purchased back in 1986. When I was 22 years old, I had the opportunity to travel to Tahiti. On the day before I flew home, I passed by a duty-free store and saw a watch in the window that I instantly fell in love with. I walked into the store and found out that the price of the watch was $2,786. I did not make a lot of money back then, but I had to have it. I handed the salesman my credit card and was informed that it would take 24 hours for the international credit card transaction 
to be approved. Since my flight was leaving the next day, I told the salesman that I could not purchase the watch. He told me, no problem, go ahead and charge the watch and he would meet me at the airport the next day. I took a leap of faith and paid for the watch and left the store empty handed. The next day I'm waiting at the airport, hoping that I wasn't being scammed. About 15 minutes before my flight was about to leave, I saw the salesman rushing into the airport. He handed me the watch and I was on my way. So here is the watch. It's a two-tone Rolex Oyster Quartz, reference number 17013. I know quartz watches aren't as popular as mechanical watches, but I've enjoyed this watch for many years and still love the look of this model. Let me know what you think. My only regret is that I didn't purchase the stainless steel Daytona. <laughs> well, yes, you certainly would have been, in, ter in terms of value, in terms of money, you certainly would have been better off if you did purchase a stainless steel Daytona back then. I'm not quite sure what those went for back in 1986. I would imagine it was south of $4,000. Uh, but the story behind it is absolutely amazing. It's true that the quartz models from Rolex aren't quite as collectible. And uh, again, uh, 80s, in the 80s, you're sort of where your story was still dealing of the leftovers of the production that kept on going post quartz wars, right? Where Seika almost uh, blew the big uh, Swiss boys out of the water, right? And uh, luckily they didn't last long and we still have all these mechanical wonders and not just quartz watches to deal with. But nevertheless, by the sound of your voice and how you told the story and how memorable that story is, it certainly sounds like, was it 14, 34, 35 some years later, you still love that watch, you still wear that watch, and you certainly can tell that story anytime you get a chance. And if one of these days you will pass that story on to someone, it certainly will sound pretty taboo because nowadays with airport security and things of that nature, there's no way in hell can anybody run up to your plane 15 minutes before the flight departs to hand you a Rolex. Hold that plane! Sir, you can't go in there! It's okay! Rolex salesman. Just not something that would happen nowadays. And of course, a credit card won't take 24 hours to process either, no matter where you are in the world. But I love the story, I love the submission, I love the dial on that one, by the way. Uh, enjoy that watch for years to come, and hopefully one of these days you'll pass it on to someone who can continue telling that story. Uh, next one is from Christopher from Osan Air Base in Korea. I have been to Osan Air Base in Korea. In fact, I was stationed in I was stationed in South Korea back in the early 90s when I was in the military and I was stationed at Camp Pelham, which is right up on the DMZ. Let's see what Christopher shows us. Ian, Roman, happy new year from Osan Air Base here in Korea. I'd like to talk to you about a watch I have and um, I've had it for a dozen years here. Uh, for it's gone with me on four different military deployments and that happens to be this formula one uh, i was uh deployed and i saw this during a uh, trip to the navy vx and i just kind of fell in love with it i like that it had uh, the rotating bezel which i use most of the time but it has a chronograph and this chronograph allows me to time tasks within a task which end up i end up doing a lot here in the military so um, it met everything that I needed. Even when I thought about getting a nicer watch, that maybe an automatic watch that had the same functions, it was hard to find something that had the same functions and allowed me to do what I needed. And this one has just been with me for so long that it's been hard for me to let it go. It's just a lot of history there. So I've had that one for about a dozen years, but one that I've had even longer happens to be this one coming up right here. Now this one I got when I was in basic training when I was 18 years old. Uh, back in 1995, I was 18 years old, getting ready to go to basic training and I bought this watch. It's uh, just your Timex, you know? I bought this one and it's gone with me every single time I've gone to a different country. Even when I take the, the tag, I always just make sure this one has a battery. I don't really care about the time, but uh, I just put a battery in this one and it goes with me. It's been through basic training twice, <laughs> uh, seven different deployments on three different continents. And it uh, has never failed me. You know, it's been through hell and back. And in fact, when I did get out of the military, it's the one thing 
that I did keep. I didn't keep my uniforms. I didn't keep any my ribbons or anything like that, but I did keep this watch. And when I retire here coming up in about a year, I will keep this watch again. So I just wanted to send you my submission from Osan Air Base and uh, tell you I love your channel and I hope you all have a happy new year. Bye. Osan, South Korea, 51st fighter wing, I believe. Uh, oddly enough, the stone monument, I think that's located in the Korean sector of the base. And I believe it reads men of great conviction, if I'm not mistaken. I somehow remember somebody telling me that. I have no idea. Uh, last time I was in South Korea was, was in 1994, 95. That's how long it's been since I've been to South Korea. I uh, still remember a few words, oddly enough. First of all, Christopher, thank you very much for your service. And uh, what can I say about your submissions? I'm obviously more excited about the Timex than I am about the TAC Hoyer, although the, I don't want to discount the TAC Hoyer because you deemed it to be what a watch is, and that is a tool, and you've used it numerous times just as a tool, but nevertheless, it's still a kick-ass looking TAC Hoyer, right? I consider it to be a high-end watch by most out there, right? That's actually relatively affordable. TAC Hoyer has a lineup where you don't have to be a millionaire to buy yourself a fancy watch, and it is a fancy watch. As far as your Timex is concerned, I had a similar watch in the military, and I wish I would have kept it. It wasn't, it wasn't that particular Timex, but it was a little electronic Timex watch that I actually bought at the PX right after my basic training as soon as I landed in Korea. Because I did my basic in Fort Knox, I did my MOS in Fort Knox, so after about five months of training, I was transferred over to South Korea after a brief break at home. When I got there, I bought myself that watch. And I believe that watch was somewhere around $25, if I'm not mistaken, back then. $25 or $35, something like that. And I did keep that watch throughout my military career. I didn't buy myself any fancy watches while in the military. I had that watch the entire time I was in the military. I was active in the military. And after I left the military, unfortunately, I don't remember what I did with it or what happened to that particular watch, although right now I wish I did, especially watching your story. I did keep my uniforms. I still have my original uniforms and I still have a lot of the original military stuff and ribbons that I've had while I was in the military, uh, but that's not important. What's important is that your story really defines a slogan, I guess I can come up with, that says, if this watch could tell a story, what a story it would tell. So I hope you hold on to both of those watches and that someday pass them on to someone, but don't just pass those watches on, pass them on with the story, and do tell some of the stories and some of the things that watch may have seen. Between all the things you have gone through while being in active service, I'm sure you've seen some action and some terrible things, but that's the story that your watches are going to tell. And besides passing those watches and also holding on to those watches, you should also hold on to those stories and pass those stories on. Thank you for your service and thanks a lot for this submission. I really, really appreciate it. Next one is from Jace from Northern Ontario. Hi, Roman and hi, Luxury Bazaar uh, employees and uh, uh, fellow uh, watch enthusiasts. My name is Jace. I come from Northern Ontario, Canada. I just got my grill at the age of 20. This is my graduation gift to myself I bought. This is my Rolex Submariner reference 114-060. Um, Ian can probably pop up a picture about that. And um, yeah, I'm happy to get my grills. Wanted to share it. Um, yeah, I, I love the dynamics of it, the simplicity. And um, overall, um, it's, it's one of my grails that I achieved and that I love. Um, my passion for watches started when I was 12 years old. I bought myself a Timex, it was my first watch ever. Um, I still have it in my collection today. And then from there, my passion just grew. So um, I'm sure Ian can pop up these pictures for me if I can do so, please. Um, my first luxury watch was a Tudor Prince uh, vintage uh, reference number 9050, gold folded. And then from there, um, I bought my first Rolex a couple of years later which was a vintage Rolex Datejust 1601 two-tone. From there, I sold that and bought myself a uh, Breitling Super Ocean 44 Abyss. And I sold that and I bought a Omega Seamaster 42 millimeters gray ceramic on the blue strap. And, uh, you know, I just never really scratched the surface and I thought I was going to be done buying watches and always knew and uh, that I wanted a Submariner. And from there, I bought the Rolex Datejust. Um, 126 300 i think that is the reference number it was on the white dial and i love the cyclops but i didn't like it after a while because i didn't like the dirt on there you know it was a love kind of hate relationship with the cyclops and so when it came to me getting my grail i decided to go for the no date submariner but i like to call it the rolex submariner 
because this is the original design of the Rolex Mariner without the Cyclops. So, and uh, yeah, I fell in love with it and I got my grill piece. Well, Jace, I love the timeline of your collection and how it grew. I also love the fact that you still have your first Timex and let's be realistic. Obviously, the reason you have your Timex because that unlike the other watches you've purchased in the past, this is, this is not something you can trade up and Timexes don't exactly hold their value as you can imagine. So I love the fact that you still have your first watch. And as I said in the pre, for the previous submission, I wish I had my little Timex that I bought while I was in the military. But nevertheless, I love to see how your collection progressed. Makes a couple of points. Number one, the Rolex is still king. This is Rolex number three in your collection. In between, you had the Omega, you had the Brighton, you had a Tudor, which technically is that other Rolex as well, right? And you mentioned one cool thing, and that is the Cyclop. You decided to go with the no date sub, which, is the, which was the original design, number one. And number two, you mentioned that it collects dirt, and it does. The little bubble on top of the dial does indeed collect dirt in the crevice around that bubble. I'm sure some of you guys have noticed that, and if you haven't, Keep in mind that it does do that. The Rolex, the Rolex Cyclop or the bubble that's on top of the date around the edge of that bubble does collect dirt. I appreciate you mentioning that. I don't think I've ever mentioned that to anybody or heard anybody actually say it, although most people know it. I was glad to hear that you were able to progress and become more successful in order to be able to afford a more expensive watch that is to date the most expensive watch you have owned. And I also think that this is not a watch you're going to actually end up trading. And I really hope that your next watch, this is not a trade up from this, but yet an additional watch to your collection. Sounds by the way you were describing that particular watch and by the way you kind of quickly went through what you had and kind of got rid of without, you know, really any remorse, sounds like this is the one watch you're going to end up keeping. And the next watch you're going to be purchasing is hopefully going to be in addition to your Rolex no date sub. I certainly love all the submissions that I received today and the guys certainly do continue making these submissions. Moreover, I love looking at your collections, but moreover, I like hearing the stories behind it. From a crazy story like somebody hand delivering a watch to a plane the day after you've bought one 35 years ago, to a gentleman who spent his career in the military, to a watch that has seen a lot more than most watches will ever see, to a horological historical timeline of one's collection, as well as other watches that mean something or represent an event in someone's life. But this is what this show is about. It's about real watches, real people, real stories, and I certainly appreciate you guys sending these in. Hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as soon as I get more submission from you guys, you will see another episode, hopefully with some other kick-ass stories to tell. See you guys next week for my watch reviews and other videos.